Hey guys, this is Jay here from Gym Aware. Really hope you're enjoying Coach Tomato's podcast series so far. Here at Gym Aware, we've just released our brand new BBT product, Flex. Um, so I just want to give you a bit of insight into what it is and how it could help you as a coach or athlete. Flex uses brand new laser optic technology to measure barbell velocity, so like Gym Aware, it's highly accurate. The device connects straight to your iPhone or iPad. We've had an independent validation study to confirm that Flex is highly accurate. We have loads of awesome features already and our experience development team continues to work on software updates each and every day. Key performance metrics are available including both peak and mean velocity, peak and mean power, distance, bar position and bar path. If you guys want any more information on Flex velocity based training just be sure to reach out, go to our website, check us out on socials as well. But for now we hope you enjoy the rest of Coach Kamea's podcast. The world of strength and conditioning is filled with some fantastic practitioners that are always searching for more. But more what? What are strength and conditioning coaches searching for to better their ability to prepare their athletes? Well, what about cutting edge information or a place where you can find different opinions from forward thinking coaches on what you're doing, how you're doing, and try to get feedback to be better for your athletes? Or what about a place where you'll find like-minded coaches that can provide solid coaching advice and career development for you as you progress through your career as a strength and conditioning professional? Well, this is exactly why we built the Strength Coach Network. You'll have access to exclusive monthly content on top of the sensationally active forum that we have where you can communicate with coaches all over the world to find those answers that you're looking for to help you be a better practitioner for your athletes. So make sure you hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS, that's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash C-V-A-S-P-S, and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the 76th episode of Outside the Rack, brought to you by Kinetic Performance, the makers of Gym Aware. In this show, we're just going to try to dive a little deeper into the minds of the top practitioners of the world of sport performance to learn a little bit more about who they actually are and how they got to where they are today. Today, we are joined by the senior sport performance coach, the University of Louisville, Katie Jones. Katie, thanks for being with us today. Jay, thank you very much for having me on. Yet another opportunity to kind of talk about some fun things and learn a little bit from you. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm fired up. I'm glad we got to chop it up a little bit before. Always great to see you. Always great to see that, you know, what you're doing and that things are great. You know, but before we get too far into this, who is Katie Jones? Yeah. So, you know, as you had mentioned professionally, I'm the senior performance coach at the University of Louisville. And my primary responsibilities are women's basketball and lacrosse. I'm also a certified athletic trainer turned performance coach uh, in the last four years. So in my eight years of career, I've had a bit of a a career change and a, a turned took a lingering left uh, halfway through there. Uh, from a per, per personal point, uh, I'm a competitor. I am a ball of energy. I am sarcastic. I am an amateur dog trainer on the weekends. Uh, and I'm someone who just likes to interact with people, um, pick their brains and, and really just enjoy being around my teams and my coaches and getting to get better every single day. Amateur dog trainer on the weekends <laughs> is awesome. That's the only thing that I haven't gotten yet is my, my daily dose of the pup. You know, I'm sure he's somewhere taking a nap right now, but. He it's, sure is. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Check it's, my Instagram story. I already posted for the day. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to have to now. It's it's crazy. I, would, I This is like the ongoing joke, but it's really the truth. I think that like legitimately two thirds of the, likes that i put on instagram are like dog posts it's just mm -hmm. like they're just better than most other things out there it's how i'm tricking more people to give me follows because then i'll throw in some other content some professional content in there every once in a while maybe some training videos of me but for the most part it's for the likes and it's for the follows i won't give him his own instagram because he would have more followers than me and i know that i know that as a dog mom so i've already accepted it <laughs> love it i love it but listen let's get right to this here you know as someone who as you said, took the lingering left. I'm, I'm excited to hear about this. If you wouldn't mind, describe a learning situation that brought about an epiphany in your career. So 
I, I think I probably have had two large epiphanies. One was obviously career changing. And so to, to dig into that one a little bit, when I got the job at the Philadelphia Union, I was just an athletic trainer. So I had had my certification, my licensure. I had been doing that at Florida Gulf Coast for three and a half years. And when I was speaking to my director, the guy who actually hired me, Garrison Draper, his question was, do you even know who Bill Knowles is? And I was like, no, nah, I don't know who that guy is. And he said, well, maybe you should Google him because you're about to go work for him. And he's a pretty awesome guy. And based off of the interactions I've had with you, your energy level, the things you seem to be interested in, I think you and him are going to get along really well. I said, all right. So I, I Googled him. And I mean, he's given some really cool, some really cool talks. He's been on a lot of presentations. Um, I had just seen, you know, some of the things, some of the accolades that he has already done, some of the athletes he was able to work with. And so I said, all right, this guy seems like a really cool guy. And I had always felt like I didn't really fit in with other athletic trainers. And I'm going to make a very broad sweeping statement. And this is to no offense of any athletic trainer out there, but most athletic training rooms aren't the place where you're going to be yelling where you're going to be loud, where you're going to be getting after it and sweating and throwing things around. And I never really fit in there because God gave me this voice. And luckily I found a profession where I get to use it every single day to try and help other people get better. But this voice is not exactly an indoor voice. And so I never felt like the athletic training room was where I was, where I belonged, where I was going to be able to flourish into you know, whatever it is that I'm going to be in five, 10, 15 years. So the moment I walked into the Philadelphia Union Academy and I was met by this ball of energy, Bill Knowles, who seemed like he had had six Red Bulls before I even walked in the door. And he was loud and sarcastic and joking with me and giving me a hard time. And as soon as I met him, I was like, okay, this, is, this might be the guy that takes me to the next level. And sure enough, just spending the first three months of my time at the Philadelphia Union Academy I actually didn't work with any soccer players because they were all home for summer vacation, but I was watching Bill work with his professional athletes and reconditioning them back from various injuries, ankles, knees, hips, back, shoulders, whatever it was, and watching him interact with the athletes and watching his process made me look in the mirror and go, okay, this is it. This is my moment. I wasn't meant to be in an athletic training room. I think I'm really good at what I do, and I'm glad I have the education that I have but I am, I'm not supposed to be in there. I'm supposed to be clanging and banging with loud rock music, screaming at these athletes, getting after it and getting better every day. That's what I need to do. And that's what Bill showed me by, leader, by leading that I can do that. As an athletic trainer, I can do that. And I can step out of what I thought the role in this little box was about what being an athletic trainer is and interacting with athletes in a different way with a different goal in mind and being able to really just flourish and it's okay to be loud doing what I do now. It's okay to, to like loud music in, in the gym and, you know, an athletic training room. Generally, you don't want loud banging music while you're trying to have conversations with athletes. So the first epiphany was I'm in the wrong profession and I need to make a change. and I need to not be afraid to go ahead and do what I feel like I need to do right now. And so I did make a career change after spending six years, six and a half years in school to be an athletic trainer. Uh, within a year and a half, I decided to do that. I didn't want to do that anymore. So <laughs> that was epiphany number one. Um, and then I think epiphany number two for me was when I was working with Bill and the professional athletes, and he was really um, mentoring me for two years on, hey, I know this is how you used to do things. This is how I do things. Why don't I show you how I do it and why I do it? And you can decide what you want to do from there. I didn't realize that there was different velocities to athletic movements. So I mean the force velocity curve, right? And I had went and gotten my certified strength and conditioning specialist certification. And so you learn about sets and reps and intensities and you learn about, you know, okay, if you wanna do hypertrophy, you're gonna do this many reps at this much intensity, but it doesn't really get into the force velocity curve very much. And so in my head, I was like, yeah, okay, we'll do three sets of 10, we'll do four by six, we'll do five by five, we'll do five by three, whatever. But Bill wasn't really interested in all of that stuff. Like, obviously, that was the base of what we were doing. We were never going to do something that just didn't make sense. But it wasn't necessarily about the sets and the reps and the intensity. It was about the velocity with which you do it. And a healthy athlete who has reached athletic normal can do all these movements at varying velocities. Athletes that are injured and are no longer athletic normal sometimes have lacking velocities in different movements. 
And what Bill is really great at doing is identifying where those deficiencies are. So you might be thinking, okay, I'm going to work on maybe a step up or um, like a lateral lunge, but you're not thinking about how long it takes the athlete to get in and out of that position. You're not thinking about, am I going to do long response and maybe do like an eccentric and do an ISO, or am I going to do a short response and get out and get back really fast? A lot of athletic trainers, and this was my education, was just get out and get back. What do you mean? What do you mean you can do it fast? You can do it slow. What do you mean you can add a plyometric into it to make it a really short response, you know, snappy movement? So when I started seeing a lot of movements that I was familiar with, but done in a, a velocity range that I wasn't familiar with. So the first thing that pops into my head was he was having an athlete who was coming back from an ACL do a lateral bound, back, just a continuous lateral bound side to side. And he had a hurdle on the ground that was about 12 inches. So they had to reach a minimum height going from side to side. And he also had lines. So they had to go a maximum, a minimum distance. But not only did he do that, he also played a metronome. And so the metronome made it a medium response lateral bound, which I had never seen before in my life, where yes, you can go from side to side and you can make it really slow and stick the landing and then produce force and stick the landing, or you can make it really fast, right? And be super stiff. But what he was doing was playing a metronome at different intensities based on the day. And the athlete had to match the metronome every time they landed side to side, which changed how long it took them to get in and out of positions. And that's how he was able to kind of manage the intensity or the reps or the volume of what we were doing is he actually focused a lot on velocities because athletic normal athletes don't have decrements in varying velocities. Athletes that are coming back from injuries do. And so that was a huge eye opener to me that I have no idea. I, I had no idea that it's not just about the lateral lunge. It's not just about the lateral bound. It's the varying speeds you can get in and out of those movements and the positions and the time that you spend in those positions that really helps these injured athletes get back to normal. I dig it. And I think that that's something that's really overlooked when it comes to how you can progress things as well, right? Is that like everyone just thinks that it's volume down, intensity up, but really understanding that speed of movement needs to be something that is accounted for as well. You know, I, I think that it's starting to become cool again to run fast. Uh, I don't know why for a while it wasn't cool to run fast. Uh, I can't be cool anymore because it's cool to run fast because I'm old and can't run fast, but understanding those sort of intricacies are really something that I think separates the haves from the have nots maybe is how I want to say mm -hmm. that, you know, and it's, that's important. Yeah. And that was something that like, again, I told you, like I got my, my CSCS certification. So like I read the book cover to cover highlighted it, annotated in it. Like I read that book and it does cover force velocity, but at the same time, I didn't know how to apply it. I don't know what that meant in real life because again, I'm not a performance coach by nature. I'm not an exercise science major. I'm an athletic trainer. So I'm coming from everything's three by 10. Everything is slow, isometric. Everything is mm, probably not heavier than 15 pounds because you're not going to find that in most athletic training rooms. That was where I was coming from. So to see someone break down a movement like that, like a lateral bound to a metronome to adjust for the speed of movement along that force velocity curve. I was like, my mind was absolutely blown. And that's when I said, holy crap, I need to learn a lot more about all of the different variations you can do to try and get an athlete back to athletic normal. And then it helps when you take those healthy kids and you work on that also, because they probably aren't very good at the coordination of that. And they would benefit from some of that. But I think that is a huge hole in the education and the uh, ability to take something that you read and actually apply it to what you're doing from most sports medicine professionals. I was one of them. I just had no idea that this was even a thing. I knew you could do stuff slow, but I didn't realize that it matters when you do it slow versus when you do it fast versus when you pick something in the middle. It does matter when you do that with an athlete. It matters when they're coming back from injury. It matters when they're healthy but they didn't say that necessarily in the book that I read. So my brain never went there until I saw it in person. No, I dig it. And I think that that's a great lead in because, you know, as someone who, you know, was in sports medicine until you were about 25 and mm -hmm. was willing to 
make that turn and has had kind of these aha moments when it comes to needing to dig and learn more, you've got to be inquisitive if you're going to be willing to ask those questions and to dig. So if you wouldn't mind, I would love to hear if Katie Jones could ask one question and she knows she would get the answer to it, what would that question be and why? So I've actually thought about this because I was waiting for the one time you were going to ask this. All right. So I listened to the Sean Smith podcast. He's a coworker of mine, a colleague of mine. And his question was, what is it about human nature that makes people complacent? And when he asked that question, I was like, well, one, that's a good question, Sean. Good job. But my mind actually went in the opposite direction. And my question is, what is it about the Kobe Bryants, the Mamba mentality, the Michael Jordans, the David Goggins? the Cameron Haynes, what is it about those individuals that refuse to be complacent, that refuse to accept mediocrity and have this relentless self-improving mentality? And can you put it in a bottle? Because I'd love to have some. I dig that. I think that that's a great way to look at it because you would have to know both sides of it. You know, you would have to know what holds them back, but you'd also need to know what is the driving factor behind all of that. You know, like what was it that allowed that inner monologue with Goggins to keep going? And what was it with Michael that allowed him to do what he did in New York with the flu and, you know, Kobe to make a free throw with a freaking blown Achilles and like, you know, all of those things. Like the... The, the insane amounts of things that these high performers are able to endure. Um, what's insane to us that these right. high performers are, to, but to them, it's just like, I had to do that. Like, I think that's sensational. There was a story about Kobe and it was like, he was in the gym day before a game. Let's say tip up was at nine. He was in the gym at like 1 PM getting shots up, doing his normal workout. And around like 2.30, you know, full sweat in, he'd already done an hour and a half. Uh, another player from the other team came into the gym to do a workout and get shots up. And that guy was like, oh man, Kobe's already sweating. He's probably gonna be done in about 30 minutes or so. That's cool. And went and did his own 90 minute workout. And when he took his shoes off, he looked over and Kobe was still going. So three hours into, you know, this, this workout on your own, this guy's like, man, there's a game at nine o'clock. What's this guy doing? It's like three o'clock already. Got his stuff and left the gym. And he asked Kobe after the game, he was like, hey man, like, why were you in the gym so long today? Kobe was like, I wasn't gonna let you be the last person out of the gym. I didn't care how long I'd been in there. I wasn't gonna let you be the last one out of the gym. And it's like, what? Like how, how is it that you can just embrace and love the grind so much that you are like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long I'm in here. I'm not gonna let you see me finish before you. Like I'm gonna let you know that you're leaving before I'm gonna leave. And then I'm still gonna drop 30 on you. And they just embrace the grind and they get up on days where they don't want to work out and they go work out anyway. Whereas there's days I wake up where I'm like, no, it's not, it's not the day for me, you know? And I want to know, like some people have that and some people don't. And I don't think it's something that everybody can just have. I really don't. Because if everybody could just have it, we'd all have it. There'd be nothing special about it. You know, if everything's important, nothing's important. So what is it that builds that? Is it something you're born with? Is it, is it nature versus nurture? Like, is it something that your parents can help instill in you? Because I'm lucky enough to have a couple athletes that I currently work with who, they might not have the full mama mentality, but they have a lot more of it than I've seen of a, a lot of other athletes that I've worked with. They embrace the grind. The, the grosser it is, the better. The harder you can make it on them, the better. And they love it and they come back tomorrow and they ask for more. You got to kick them out of the gym because they just are so obsessed with being better today than they were yesterday. And it's not even about being better than my teammate or being better than her. It's about like, I got to get better. I got to get better. I can't take a day off, Katie. I know you told me to go home, but I have to get in the gym. Can we get another workout in? I got to get in the gym. I got to get shots up. Why? I just have to get better. Like there's something in those people that if you could bottle it, oh man, human beings would be a whole lot better off if we all had something that we were so obsessed about that we were willing to do whatever it took to do it. And like the people like, like Jordan, Kobe, like, I, I just, I mean, there's, there's all those people we probably think of four or five more that what is it about their ability to just turn that on and do that every day 
that separates them from the rest of us normal human beings. Yeah, no doubt. And I think that the best thing that we can do is just embrace the time we have with the kids that are like that because they're not all like that. And it's sure. a much better fight to have than the, I just need you to come in, please. <laughs> you know, <laughs> which we all deal with at times too. Mm-hmm. But no, I mean, and the third one, I think this is a hard one right now, especially in the middle of basketball season, as we were talking earlier, because who knows what we're going to do in 45 minutes, let alone 45 days. But when the opportunity presents itself as someone who does push yourself to be better and does love spending time to work with these kids and has all the, the other responsibilities outside of just with women's basketball, with the other teams you get. What's your escape? Well, I bought a house in May. So it's my first house. I am really enjoying home improvement projects. So whether it's just like hanging up some blinds or building a closet or painting walls, um, I actually really enjoy just being able to look at my house and be like, you know what, I want to change this. And breaking out the power tools and drilling holes. Like I'm, I'm all about that. And that's something that was very surprising to me. I didn't think I would enjoy any of that because I've never done that previously in all the houses that I've rented. You don't really take like homeowner's pride in something like that, but working around the house doing home improvement has been a big one. I also got my dog in May. So he is, as I, I talk about him in every single podcast I'm on because he really is so much of my life. I spend so much time just trying to make sure that like he's challenged every day. And so I'm probably just pouring some of my own issues onto him being like, Yo, Riggs, you got to be better today than you were yesterday, dude, sit. You got to work on sit, you know? So training him and spending time with him and making sure that he's continuing to learn, which is helping me learn because I've never really owned my own dog before. I've grown up with dogs, but he's my first dog. So learning how to be a quote unquote amateur dog trainer on the weekends jokingly, but at the same time, how can I get him to do what I want him to do so that he thinks it's fun so that he wants to do it. So I could also do it whenever I want to um, has been really challenging. So that's been like a new hobby of mine is like, how can I make him better, but also learn how to get better at doing this. And then, I mean, my other, my other escape is, is half off margaritas on Wednesday. I don't know about you, but. <laughs> yeah, no, right now I'm away from all of the fun stuff because we're back on 75 hard. I think that, what we talked about earlier, the uh, the typhoon-like fluidity that is this season right now um, took too many stress relievers, I guess you could say early <laughs> on. And I was like, yeah, dude, we got to clean this up. Um, but no, I'm with you on that. Like it's, there's something to it. Like the, the number of days, especially right now, where it's just like, man, like not having the ability to go home and just have a beer and decompress. There's times I'm just like, man, I would, that would help. I, but. I do miss the social aspect too, of being able to go out and just like have drinks with friends and coworkers. Like not being able to do that is, that's tough. That's been really tough. And, and I can't wait for when we don't have to worry about this anymore. And, and I can actually go out and enjoy myself with, with my friends and just let off steam like we normally do, because I feel like as you know, performance coaches, even with our staff, like we were very close and we would go out and have socials all the time and just get to know each other outside of a weight room, you know, and we're definitely missing a part of that. So I'm very much looking forward to when, when COVID is done and things hopefully go back to whatever new normal it is that we're going to be in. Um, you know, we can, we can decompress like we used to just because uh, it's, it's tough. It, luckily home improvement and training my dog, I can do those with no one else around. So I can socially distance and go ahead and still get some of that stress off my back. No doubt, dude, no doubt. Well, Katie, it's great to see you. I'm so glad you're doing well and everything's great down there. And I truly appreciate your time as always. It's, this is great to catch up and this is some great stuff. Thank you so much. Of course, again, thank you for having me on. Yeah, we'll be in touch real soon. Cheers. Cheers.